Welcome to Love in the Pot. Join me as we create a large batch recipe of turkey meatloaf. My version is infused with mushrooms and served with a creamy mushroom gravy. You can use this recipe as a guide to help you make something wonderful for the next large gathering that you're hosting. So let's get started and please be patient. This is a long process and I didn't want to speed through or delete too many important steps. So please be patient, zoom through where you need to and enjoy. Let's get going.
bake. Bake until it has an internal temperature of 185 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a large meatloaf that may take two or more hours. Okay, back to our gravy. I am going to add my one stick of butter to the two thirds cup of oil that I have heating here. And before we start to form the roux, we're going to flavor that fat. So I have some fresh thyme from the garden. We'll add some sprigs of that. And I'll strain this gravy as well, so I'm not really worried about things being in it. And I also have some diced pepper and onion left over from the actual meatloaf. I didn't use it all. I wanted to reserve some to make the gravy. And if there's even more left, always make a veggie for topping or an omelet. Really based off of preference, you can make it hotter if you like a lot of heat or you can eliminate it all together if you don't want things hot. When you make a roux, you use equal parts fat to equal parts flour. Of course, if you're trying to make a healthier version, you have to work the um, liquid more to smooth it out. However, you could certainly use less fat. It just would require a bit more work to make sure that lumps don't form. So I'll probably add about two cups of flour to this fat mixture here. Should start smelling aromatic as the herbs are waking up. I have all purpose flour. Let the root cook for about one minute or less. Not enough to brown, just enough to get the raw flour taste out. And once I add my liquid, I'm going to switch to using a whisk. Let's add some of the leftover garlic rosemary puree from the meatloaf. And I like to add this in last so it doesn't burn. starts to get kind of spongy looking with the sizzle around the edge but it's not burning. I'm at the point now I'm going to add my broth and finish it with a little cream or half and half. There are three stages of root. White, blonde, and brown. And it's kind of self-explanatory with the color but the darker it gets the deeper the flavor is. However, the darker it gets the less thickening ability it has. So, we do want to build a little flavor. That's why we're cooking this one for about one minute. And then we will get our broth in there. I'm going to start thickening once that liquid is in there. So to give yourself time to get it all in, turn the temperature to low so that it doesn't become a big gelatinous mess on you. I made a lot of this because I want my meatloaf to have enough gravy to rest in. That will do two things. That will allow it to stay moist and it will also kind of help continue to tenderize the meat. So since I have a huge pan of meatloaf, I'm just going to make sure I have enough gravy to go around. I'm also going to infuse this with some mushroom flavor as well. Ideally, I would have liked to brown my mushrooms at the same time, but my mushrooms went bad, so I had to ask someone to go to the store real quick to get me some more mushrooms. So we'll add that in midway in this process. I added water, so I'm going to add some stock base to give that water flavor. 
hold off on salt because stock base is concentrated. Some stock base is high. So I really like using this variety. Kroger has it too. I got this one at Walmart. So now that we have all of our liquid in there, there are no signs of clumps. It's completely liquefied so I can raise my temperature up and let it slowly thicken. Now that we've gotten the danger of lumps out of the way. And as you're dipping, you want to get those corners of your pot so that you don't have a big blob of it in there burning. I have about one third of the quart here. I'm going to add all of that. And if you put your container at the back of a warm stove, it will cool the cream that's clinging to the inside of the carton and liquid it right. So I'm gonna add that in too once it's ready. Now that we're liquidy, I'm gonna add my three bay leaves. And I know this is gonna need more seasoning, but I just wanna taste it in about 10 minutes to see where the flavor profile is before I add anything. See, literally it's been about 30 seconds and it poofed up just hanging out at the back of my stove and watch how much more I can get out. The key to thickening with flour or roux or anything that's flour based like a slurry is that it needs to come to a full boil before you know the ability of its thickening power. Once it boils, it is at its thickening level. So then you can adjust it accordingly. If it is not thick enough, you can add slurry or more root. And also, as our meat loaf cooks and gives off juices, I'm going to finish the final gravy with some of that juice. All right, tidy as you go. Once it thickens, we're going to finish it with the drop of lemon juice and adjust the seasoning. See if I need more garlic, if it needs a little salt, if it needs a little pepper. Remember, we smashed our, well, we pureed our garlic with a little salt to help preserve it and liquefy it. And the chicken bone broth base has sodium in it too. So you may not need any. However, once the flavors develop, taste it and tweak it. Also, once our meatloaf is almost done, I'm going to add some of the broth from that that rendered out to give a more intense flavor to our gravy. And I considered that when I was thickening the gravy. So it's slightly thicker right now because I know I'm going to add more liquid later once that liquid is available to me. So don't be alarmed at the thickness of the gravy at this stage. We can always adjust it. See how nice and thick it is now? Much thicker than what we started. This is not as thin as I would like it, but remember we're gonna be adding broth from the turkey meatloaf. So I want it to leave room to thin it out.
Now that I'm going to beautiful golden brown, I'm going to add some salt, and I'm going to add some of the garlic rosemary puree that we used in the meatloaf. See how pretty they are? It's just how I like my mushrooms. Salt, garlic puree. Once we add this, we literally can only cook it for a few moments because we don't want the garlic to burn. You're building flavor. You can get these in your freezer section already peeled and ready to go and for under $2. Take the garlic powder and some of the same chicken chicken seasoning we did on the mushroom. And see one with skin, we'll take him out. We we'll continue the same flavor palette with thyme. Thyme in those flavors. And we're gonna add a little bit of the garlic puree once they caramelize. Also to our gravy, I've added some of the liquid from the mushroom meatloaf, as well as some of our seared mushrooms to reinforce that mushroom flavor. Now that it's been cooking on low, I'm gonna taste it to see what the flavor is like. My scented. It is nappe. The culinary term means soft consistency. Mm, it's very good. I'm gonna add a little more garlic taste to that. A touch of lemon juice. And when I take my meatloaf out of the oven, I'll add more broth. Okay, look, our onions are coming along. A little pinch of sugar will speed up the process on the onions but make sure that you lower the temperature so they don't burn. Garlic puree. Okay, we're gonna set these onions to the side. See, they're brown and lovely. Right here to the same container with my mushroom. Okay. And we will garnish, be careful if these things are hot. We will garnish our meatloaf with this. In the meantime, uh, we're going to pull the flavor of all of the things we've sauteed in this skillet off of the pan by deglazing it. Now you can do that with a little white wine. In this case, I'm gonna just do it with a little bit of water and add broth base to it if my gravy needs it. When you eat glaze, it's a culinary term meaning you're going to pull the brown bits off the bottom of the pan. And the way you do that is you have to have a hot pan and cold liquid. I have some cold water going in. All that caramelization from the mushroom as well as the onion. Great cooking really is all about good quality product that's well manipulated and that is seasoned in layers. Again, I've added the liquid from the meatloaf as well as the deglazed liquid from the saute pan. Added in more of that broth for my turkey. Okay, we're gonna finish up our gravy. It has all its flavor components in it. I'm just gonna bring it to a boil now that it's been thinned with the meatloaf juice to make sure it's at its full thickening ability because I don't want it to turn into a gelatinous mess in the shaping pan. So I'm gonna do that now. And if it's too thick, I'm gonna add more liquid. 
all right and then taste and adjust every time you add liquid or add something new to make sure the flavor is still nice okay it's getting ready to boil see those bubbles well not to burn yourself my pot is pretty full so if you're doing this at home you certainly won't need to make a monstrous batch unless you're serving the body or a large gathering. However, if you do, you could probably use a taller pot to give you some leeway when it starts to boil. Okay, our meatloaf is nearly done. I pulled it out of the oven at 155 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I'm going to uncover it and let the top caramelize so that it will be ready to receive our gravy. I am going to make sure that I cook it to an internal temperature of 185 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm probably about 20 minutes away. So let's continue the process. This meatloaf went in the oven at five o'clock from cold because I prepped it last night and it has been in the oven for about an hour and 45 minutes. a little but honestly it really didn't shrink that much because we trapped the moisture and allowed it to steam so it's gonna look ugly right now but we're gonna clean it up take this off I'm gonna scrape off the debris that I don't want I have a rubber spatula I'm just gonna get that goo off not to tear up your meatloaf. And I'm going to do this, remove this goo out of the pan, and then I am going to drizzle it with a little olive oil and brush it. I may even lace that olive oil with some of our leftover garlic puree and some fresh thyme to reinforce the same flavors over and over again. I'm building flavor. Coagulate it good. Nobody wants that. About a half a spoon of our garlic rosemary puree, a sprig of thyme. If I have an overabundance of it. And some olive oil just to help crisp the skin so that it will be really a really nice texture once the gravy goes on top. Mind you, once it comes out of the oven, it needs to rest for at least 10 minutes before you cut into it. Give the juice time to redistribute in the meat cells so that you're not left with a dry meat bowl. Last step on our gravy, I'm gonna strain it and remove all the big chunks. Steady so it doesn't splash you, it's very hot. I'm using a mesh strainer so that it gets all the small particles. Okay, so as you see, our meatloaf is out of the oven. It's fully cooked. I caramelized the top, and now I'm gonna let it rest for about 10 to 15 minutes, and I'm gonna slice it and pan it up so that it can be portioned and drizzled with the gravy. Big meatloaf done. It's huge. I'm gonna split it down the middle to make two rolls out of this loaf. As you can see, it's golden, it's crisp, it's beautiful, it's still juicy, and I have my creamy mushroom gravy to go on top, as well as a garnish of pearl onions and mushrooms, and then I'm gonna sprinkle it all with a little garden fresh thyme. Yum, yum. Okay, I've allowed the meatloaf to rest. Now I am going to use a spatula as well as a slicing knife to make my cuts. You can use your regular chef's knife, but this will give you cleaner slices. That's why it's a slicing knife. So this is a humongous loaf. I'm gonna go in half, and then I'll make my slices so they're manageable 
in their correct portion sizes. So I'm gonna score it. Now, just go down into the meat. Mind you, whenever you make any type of roasted meat, whether it be grilled, roasted, seared, it's best to allow it to rest for at least 10 minutes, especially something of this size. That way the juices won't come running out as soon as you cut it. Just let the juice redistribute in the meat cells. So now I'm gonna slice it in half and then just continue to break down the slices. I love the end pieces. Watch your hand. And since I've cut them in half, I want to make sure that they're thick enough to be a decent portion for one person. Keep it all together as you're slicing so it doesn't fall apart. And again, this was baked to a temperature of 185 degrees Fahrenheit. Any casserole or blended meat item like a meatloaf or stuffed chicken or whole poultry should be cooked, cooked to that temperature of Dallas. So invest in a digital food thermometer to ensure that you're keeping food safe and cooking it to the correct dumbness. it in the order that I removed it and just shingle it down bit by bit. Lining your pan with foil also helps for easy cleanup later, but be mindful as you're getting your slices that you do not put foil in your serving dish. Beautiful. All right, as you can see, I have my beautiful shingles. Now, let's dress it with our gravy. If your gravy formed a skin because it's been sitting, just whisk it to recombine everything. Make sure there's enough for it to be served with it. I even have velouté sauce left over to make a pot pie with or something else later in the week. So I'm gonna cool it, label it, and date it so that I am able to put that to use and it's safe. Shift it a little, so I'm just gonna realign everybody. We're gonna dress it with beautiful mushrooms and pearl onions. 
this way it's no mystery as to what's inside. Now I'm gonna dress it with some cracked black pepper, a little of the seasoning that we put in there and some fresh thyme for color. This is the beauty in growing things. It's so wonderful to go outside and just pick something from the garden and bring it right in the house and use it. Remember, presentation is everything. Perception is so important. So take the time to dress it and make it beautiful. After all, you went through so much trouble to make this dish. Why not make it stand out? Whatsoever you find thy hand to do, do it with thy might. That's my favorite scripture, literally. And I have my beautiful time. I'm just going to rip some little pieces here and there. I don't know if you noticed, but my meatloaf really didn't What I did was I encased it with that parchment paper. For one, that would help it not stick to the foil and pull away. For two, it would also help promote steaming. And then I wrapped it with foil and encased it around it. And when I made the meatloaf, I made sure I implemented lots of moisture with the fresh cut bell pepper and onion and I didn't put a ton of binder. I don't particularly care for breadcrumbs. I prefer to use flour or even a little bit of Parmesan with that flour if it's in theme of what I'm creating with the combination of some eggs. So that's how I like to bind my meatloaf and I'm always pleased with the results. I've never had a dry meatloaf, especially using turkey just seems to give off much more flavor and moisture and I did not bake it at 350 because I wanted to make sure I did not miss the feast today I baked it at 375 just to speed up the cook time and it took about two hours to bake maybe even two hours and 15 minutes counting the times I took it out and drained the broth and all of that stuff so there you have it. It's beautifully dressed. We're all done. She has her makeup and jewelry on and looks fabulous for tonight's feast. I hope this helps you enjoy and remember to keep the Lord's high holy days with joyfulness and gladness. Shalom.